Thank you very much. And I would like to provide you a, a brief overview uh, of, the, of the recent jurisprudence of the Court of Justice of the European Union and also European Court of Human Rights on issues in relation to judicial independence. And I will uh, discuss this issue from a specific perspective, from a Central and Eastern European perspective, uh, from which uh, these developments are very interesting and especially if you look at the developments in the, in the case law of the CGU, it's very promising. And, uh, and uh, I, would like, I would like to start uh, with contextualizing the, the, the topic and, and setting the scene by, oh, sorry. How to use it? Okay, it was not on, by uh, giving you some examples and stories from uh, the Hungarian judiciary. The, the most important decision that was rendered uh, in 2018 was the, the, the so-called Portuguese judges case before the European Court of Human Rights. And, uh, I had the privilege last uh, uh, evening to sit and talk to the author of this decision, Mr. Judge Levitz, and uh, it's a very important judgment because it, it not invented, but at least discovered the idea or, or uh, incorporated this idea of the European judiciary into the EU law. And the, the the relevance of the decision is reflected in, in uh, speeches of judges in Hungary. We, we had a workshop uh, last year when a Hungarian judge, when contributing to the discussion, made this remark that we are not only Hungarian judges, and, but also European judges, which, uh, which means that of course we, we speak not only on behalf of the, of the Hungarian com political community, but also on, on behalf of a broader European community. But I think that, that uh, in this statement there was some hope that the European Court of Justice can provide some uh, important protection for those judges who are under attack now in, in Hungary. The other uh, episode is um, a legal case uh, in Hungary. Uh, and I, I would like to just highlight the, the reaction of the, the National Office for the Judiciary is, is, the, is, the, is the central organ for uh, court administration in Hungary. The, uh, just very briefly on the, on the facts of the case, there was, a, there was a judge who applied for uh, a higher judicial office in Hungary and, and his application was ranked by the competent uh, uh, expert committee. It, it is called the Local Judicial Council, a first in two consecutive uh, uh, application procedure. But finally, he, he was not uh, appointed to this higher uh, judicial office, but the, the procedure was terminated and the president of the National Office for the Judiciary, uh, who has the power of, of, of court administration now in, in Hungary at the central level, uh, declared the, the whole procedure unsuc unsuccessful on the ground that there is no need to, to fill this vacant position uh, just for managerial reasons, and there was no other detailed uh, arguments provided what was the why was this judge who 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 was fined qualified by the by the judicial council by their peers why he was not qualified uh, uh, for the president of the national office for the judiciary and this judge uh, filed a lawsuit uh, against the the president of the national office for the judiciary and uh, uh, on the first instance, 
he won the case and, and, and the court held that this practice of the president of the National Office for the Judiciary is unlawful and, and uh, abusive as well. But then the decision was appealed and uh, the second instance court uh, terminated the procedure and quashed the decision of the first instance court, arguing that uh, there is no legal judicial remedy against this decision of the president of the National Office for the Judiciary because it is not provided explicitly in, in, in the relevant legal, legal framework. And I just want to show you what was the, the, re, the official statement on this second instance decision by the National Office for the Judiciary. It, 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 if you just go through, it was the, the headline news for days. On the, on, the, on the website of the Hungarian judiciary that Veritas Vincit National Office for the Judiciary wins case against this judge, so-called Csaba Vasvári. And, and, and if you just look into the content of, of this statement, it is clear that it is full with false statement because uh, the second instance court does not find the, the the, law, the, the first instance decision unfounded. It just declared that according to the law, there is no uh, possibility to appeal against this kind of decisions of the president of the National Office for the Judiciary. And it also concluded that finally this, this uh, debate ended and the court, the second instance court, confirmed that the appointment procedure is totally in accordance with the law and there are no violations and, and judges are appointed uh, solely on the merits and on professional considerations. But it was not involved in the decision because the second instance court did not decide the case on the merit. So this was the, this was the, the headline news for days. Uh, on the website of the, of the Hungarian judiciary. And if you just look at the tone of this, of this statement, it shows that there is a very deep uh, uh, division now within the judiciary as well. There is a kind of uh, war between different groups within the Hungarian judiciary. And uh, in that case, uh, we have to uh, approach the, the, the problems of judicial independence from a different angle and not from, from the angle of constitutional democracies, but from the angle of, of, of an authoritarian uh, tendency that is uh, rising now across Europe, but it is very uh, present in the Hungarian context. And I want to uh, emphasize two very important challenge is that the courts that tries to protect judicial independence have to face. The first one is that uh, in this new kind of authoritarian regimes, the formal democratic institutions are maintained. Only they are captured or manipulated by very soft, very smart, very subtle ways. Uh, I will elaborate on uh, soon uh, what are the, these, these uh, methods or tools that are traditionally used by authoritarian rulers to uh, contain the judiciary. And the other challenge is that uh, when we are discussing issues of, of, uh, of uh, uh, organization of the judiciary, there is a heavy reference by uh, the ruling parties on the idea of sovereignty, that it is a purely domestic matter and it is the parliament who must decide on that issue and, and there is no justified supervisory power of any uh, international institution to intervene into this domestic issue. And uh, my question is that uh, taking into account this, this uh, special 
uh, elements of, of, of this debate. Where should we uh, put the responsibility to protect uh, judicial independence and who has the moral duty to, to provide safeguards for, for those judiciaries that are under attack? And there are three possible answers. First one is that it is uh, the domestic judiciary who has to protect itself, but it seems that it, it does not work. The, the culture of independence in the Hungarian judiciary is quite weak now. It's a very hierarchical structure, uh, and it, the, the powers of administration are, are really centralized. So it seems that uh, there is no uh, intent uh, coming from the, the judges, or at least the majority of the judges, to stand up against this. Uh, attacks on the judiciary. The other uh, option is that was uh, developed by the, the Selma ruling of the Court of Justice of the Euro European Union that the, 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 the member states courts can uh, protect judicial independence when they are assessing if uh, European arrest warrant can be rejected or not. They can make claims about the, the situation of judicial independence in the country that uh, issued the, the arrest warrant. And the, and the third uh, possible option is that, that uh, international courts, the, the, the Strasbourg Court or the, or the Court of Justice of the EU can uh, provide help uh, for the Hungarian judges. Of course, there is a, 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 the, the, the pressing issue whether it is a dangerous path to rely heavily so much on, on international uh, uh, institutions because it reflects the idea that the solution is uh, handled from a top-down uh, perspective and not from a bottom-up uh, perspective. But I argue that today the, the only possible uh, uh, tool is in the hands of, of the international courts to protect judicial independence. And just to list uh, uh, some of the special techniques that are used normally in, in authoritarian regimes to uh, contain the judiciary, uh, I, I give you, it's not an exhaustive list, of course, but uh, I, I brought you examples that, I've, that have been already uh, used in Hungary. The first one is the court packing when the, the constitutional court uh, was packed by uh, judges who uh, deemed to be loyal to the government. And, uh, and it was possible because the, the size of the court was extended in 2000. Then a lot of judges were dismissed as well, so it also had to remade and, and changed dramatically the composition of the courts. More than 270 judges were forced to uh, retire uh, in 2012, and of course there were a lot of vacant positions that uh, were filled afterwards. There is a very tight administrative control over judicial act over the day-to-day -day judicial activity by this very highly centralized court administration system. And there is also jurisprudential control. I just would like to give you uh, the example of, of the Hungarian Constitutional Court, who has, which has now the power to review also the constitutionality of the interpretation of, 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 uh, of ordinary courts. And it happens that that the, the Constitutional Court annuls even decisions of, of the Supreme Court uh, on the ground that it violates the, the provision of, of the, of the of fundamental rights. And this, of course, this power can be abused as well. And there are some examples that prove uh, that the, the Constitutional Court uh, is, a, is a political actor within, within this, within this uh, uh, war. The other method is also very important and interesting and in some ways unique that in the fundamental law of Hungary there is a, a special provision included 
which tries to give guidance to judges how to interpret the law. And it uh, proposed for the judges to uh, follow not only the text of the law, of course, and not, to, not only to uh, interpret the law in line with the fundamental law, but take into account, and this, this is the official translation, it's not very good, take into account the reasons that are attached to a legislative proposal, whether it is a new enactment or, a, or, a, or a, an amendment, which means that there are explanatory notes that attach to a bill. They are contained by political statement. If you just look at the, the very last amendment that was made to the Hungarian fundamental law, it is the seventh amendment, and the very first uh, sentence states the, expla the explan explanatory uh, note that uh, we are uh, facing now a big challenge by the massive inflow of migrants and uh, even Brussels and pro-migrant forces are uh, compromising the national security and, and, and seeks to change the culture of Hungary and the composition of the Hungarian popul population forever. So this is the first two sentences of a, of a reasoning that is attached to a law. And the fundamental law uh, gives the advice uh, to the judges to follow even these uh, uh, reasoning that are offered in this, uh, in this uh, uh, legislative uh, acts that are not voted, they are not normative, they are not binding. And there was a case before the Hungarian Constitutional Court when there was a clear conflict between the text of the law and the reasoning behind. And the Supreme Court interpreted uh, formally the text of the law, but this decision was annulled then, the, the Hungarian Constitutional Court, on the ground that the, the Supreme Court failed to look at what was determined in the explanatory note, which is, again, I, I want to emphasize, it's not a normative, it's no, not a normative uh, <coughs> guidance, it's, it's just something political. So this is the situation, and it's very difficult to, to uh, reveal and uncover uh, these uh, very soft and very very smart and clever uh, methods of m manipulation. And the other challenge that I also raise is that that the, the government and the and the, the ruling party refers heavily uh, on the argument of sovereignty, which is also a, a failed reference because sovereignty means that the people govern themselves and the people itself this concept is a political concept and a normative one which uh, uh, have very important conditions to be met in order to speak the, about the people. Let's, uh, I, I would give just one uh, example of these preconditions that, that people means that we are equal. Individuals who are bring together form a political community on the basis of moral equality. And if this element is missing uh, from a political community, we, we cannot uh, denote the individuals and those who uh, provide legitimacy and vote for a decision as people. And now, uh, nowadays, this idea of of uh, sovereignty and uh, the background idea of political constitutionalism, which is clearly a, a, a liberal or republican approach, has been developed by the academics from the, the right wing, and, and it is a very popular notion now, and, and a lot of reference is made in order to exclude any uh, interference by international international institutions, but we have to see that these new authoritarian systems are not based on this traditional idea of sovereignty and political 
constitutionalism because the people who is the ultimate source of the power as such, this concept is not, does not exist within, within these political settings because there is no equality, there is no media freedom, there is no respect for, for the interest of minorities, the elections are not fair to just to, just to name a, a few examples. Okay, and that's why it's very uh, uh, worrying when, when, the, when the Venice Commission makes such statement that yes, we, we accept the, the changes that are made to the Hungarian judiciary. Now, recently, a new, a, a brand new, separate uh, administrative justice system was established and the commission uh, have, ha has just launched its, its opinion in March. And it starts with the, with the statement that it belongs to the sovereignty of a state to organize its court system. But in a case when this argument of sovereignty is not working because it has no normative force, because there is no people as ultimate source of politi political legitimacy in a given, in a given uh, community, it is not, not correct to, to use the word community because it's not real a community. So in that situation, it, this argument from sovereignty is not very robust, it's not very compelling and has very little normative force. So it's, it's a pity that the Venice Commission refers to this idea. Even the Venice Commission refers to this idea. Okay, and uh, okay, I, 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 go on with the, I go on with the jurisprudence of the, of the Court of Justice. And I just want to compare the, 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 the recent developments of, of the practice of the Court of Justice of the EU and the European Court of Human Rights. And I want to highlight three cases. I don't want to go into the details. You might be familiar with these cases. But I want to emphasize here that these Portuguese justice cases that is listed first, it was a landmark uh, a case, it, was a, it, it can be seen as a turning point in the, in the jurisprudence of the Court of Justice of the EU as it uh, developed uh, the idea of, of the European judiciary and, and, uh, and uh, argued that judicial independence is also a fundamental value of the European Union that is common to the member state and that is shared by, by, all, by, by, all, by all of the, of the member states, and it can be traced back uh, even to the, to, the, to the treaties. And, and uh, it's a very important step because it made clear that Hungarian courts are also European courts, Hungarian judges are European judges, and every single member state has a general obligation to respect and to protect judicial independence, even in situations when a national court does not implement EU, EU law. So this uh, case is very important because it elevates the, the, the concept of judicial independence into a, into a constitutional status. Within, within the EU law framework. The summer judgment was also, in some sense, activist, uh, as it uh, opened the, the legal grounds for national courts to reject uh, extradition uh, initiative on human rights ground. And uh, the very last case that is not decided yet, but you can read the, the, the opinion of the Advocate General, Gen, uh, General uh, the opinion of Tanchev is also very promising as it states that uh, today even organizational issues in a national judicial system uh, can be supervised by the Court of Justice of the EU as an element of this common and commonly shared value of of, of judicial independence. So these uh, developments are, are really welcome. 
and, and promising from a Central and Eastern European perspective. And the only criticism I can make here that today the concept of, of judicial independence is not clear cut. In, in, the, in, the, in the case law of the Court of Justice, even not conceptually uh, clarified what judicial independence means. I, if, uh, if we just look at the, the, the reasoning uh, from, the, from the summer judgment, we can see that the, the court makes a, dis make, makes a distinction between uh, the external elements of judicial independence and the internal elements of judicial independence. It is clear that when it refers to the internal elements of judicial independence, it links it to the idea of impartiality, which uh, means that the, the judge uh, must be unbiased and neutral and, and, and keep the distance, equal distance uh, between the party parties and the, and the judge cannot be interested in the case and in the outcome of the case. But in the, the academic literature, internal independence means something different. It means that individual judges, when they decide cases, must be free from any internal pressure that comes within from the judiciary. And it is important because in the Central and Eastern European uh, uh, region, it is often emphasized that the problem and the pressure comes not directly from the political side and from, uh, the, from an external source, but from within inside uh, the court. And if you just go back to, to my very uh, first example, you can see that how uh, the, the central administration of the judiciary and the, the person who is entitled to exercise the, the main powers of court administration can attack or threaten judges or can launch a war against a judge who dared to appeal against one of, one of her decisions. So this is the real threat, threat, the internal threat that's coming from within the judiciary. And it is a general phenomenon uh, in all Central European countries. And the problem is that it seems that there is a, a development in the case law of the Court of uh, Justice of the European Union, but uh, the court has to clarify what internal independence means and, and implement also and incorporate this idea that comes from the academic literature into the concept of, of, of judicial independence and not confuse it with, with another very important element, impartiality. Okay, and if you just uh, go three, uh, quickly on the, on the uh, case law of the European Court of Human Rights, I, I, I just want to uh, mention two uh, very recent cases. The one uh, is about uh, the, the massive dismissal of judges in Hungary that took place in 2012 by forcing them into an early retirement. Uh, it, mean, it meant that the, the general retirement age for judges were lowered very suddenly from 70 to 62, uh, and therefore uh, uh, a lot of judges were uh, sent to retire or, and were dismissed. And the complaint uh, was rejected, the, were rejected by the European Court of Human Rights on the ground that uh, as the Hungarian uh, government uh, made uh, a compensation shame uh, to the judges and they can, uh, they had the opportunity or they had the possibility to choose whether to get a financial compensation or to, to, to be reinstated into their previous status, it provided remedies for those grievances that were suffered by the judges, and therefore these judges are not victims of, of any violence. This was one part of, 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 the, of the arguments of the, of the European Court of Human Rights. In relation to judges, in relation to judges uh, who, who received this compensation, this financial compensation, and, and in case of those judges who ask for reinstatement, 
the court claim that they do not suffer uh, such uh, damages that would substantiate the claim that their uh, convention rights was breached. And therefore, all, all the applications were found inadmissible by the European Court of Human Rights. And again, I just, I just want to uh, point out two basic uh, uh, drawbacks of the approach of the European Court of Human Rights. One is that this issue was approached basically under Article 8, which is, of course, problematic, and it shows that the, the European Court of Human Rights has clear limits how to uh, address issues, because every single issue that has to do with uh, structural problems, let's, uh, let's say judicial independence or separation of powers, must be translated into an individual human rights claim. And it was the case also with, with the vice, vice president of the, of, the, of the Supreme Court, who was also dismissed. And the claim was investigated under uh, the, uh, Article 8, the right to, to, to respect for private life. So the legal basis, uh, the legal grounds on which these uh, uh, complaints were uh, discussed are failed. And there are some arguments that is very uh, worrying that the court state that if you are a judge, you are dismissed from your office, uh, from, from, your, from your administrative office. You can keep your judicial office, but you were formerly a senior judge, uh, a, a president of the court or a vice president. You had administrative power. And if you are dismissed from it without legal grounds, it not, it, it's not so serious because the essence, the essence of uh, adjudication is the judicial function and not the administrative function. And in the Central and Eastern European context, it's very important to emphasize that, that the court presidents and those who have administrative uh, functions are very important elements of the judiciary. And in a career system, when you are promoted according to your age, Normally, this is the, the, the most you can uh, reach at the end of your career, that you became president of a, of a court. So it's a very important, very important position, and it must be taken seriously uh, even by the, the court of justice. But it seems now that this, this, uh, this, uh, this ruling and the problems with, with, with the, 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 this retirement measurement in Hungary uh, was compensated more or less by a, a brand new decision, a case from Iceland where, where the European Court of Human Rights held that there was problems with uh, and flaws and deficiencies in the process of judicial appointment. It was a case, uh, as I mentioned, from Ireland and therefore the court on which the, the appointed judge served, who was not appointed uh, in accordance with the law, was not uh, a tribunal, is, and is not a tribunal that is established by law and that has a legal basis. So it seems that even the, the European Court of Human Rights tries to uh, provide some uh, tools how to check these appointment procedures and the internal procedures within the judiciary in order to uh, mitigate the, the control that is uh, 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 exercised by, by, by court administration. But it's a pity, and I will conclude it with it, that this issue was not, in my opinion, approached from the, the the principle of judicial independence, because there was a complaint based on uh, violation of judicial independence, but it was not uh, uh, discussed by the European Court of Human Rights. And why I think that it is a problem is that uh, in the Portuguese judge's case, just going back to the, to the Court of Justice of the EU, the, the, the reasoning made it clear that 
the concept of judicial independence also incorporates the standards that are enshrined in Article 6 of the European Convention. So it means that the Court of Justice of the EU invited the European Court of Human Rights to elaborate more on what Article 6 means. How can uh, claims under Article 6 uh, pro uh, provide protection against internal attacks on the judiciary? But it seems that this Icelandic case is not the, the, the good way to follow because uh, it is not about judicial independence, although judicial independence is the concept that now really determines how the, the Court of Justice thinks about uh, protecting the judges. So uh, to conclude, if I, if I just raise the question that, that which international court is on the better way to protect judicial independence and provide safeguards uh, for those judges who cannot find uh, protection within the domestic system, I can uh, come, come to the conclusion that, that it is the uh, Court of Justice of the EU because uh, the, the Court of Justice of the EU can approach even structural problems of, of, uh, of the judiciary and it is not forced to think and transfer every single question into human rights claim, but it can address it as, as problems of separation of powers or problems of institutional aspects of judicial independence, as we now are witnessing in the case of the Commission against Poland. So it seems that the, the, central, the, the CGEU can function as a de facto constitutional court, which is, it is a term that is many times associated with the, the European Court of Human Rights. And now it is clear that we can make a, even a conceptual distinction between a human rights court, court in some sense and between a constitutional court. So the, the evolving uh, jurisprudence of, of the EU court shows that it can uh, provide some help to the, to the judiciary, but it needs to elaborate more on this concept of, of judicial independence and clari clarify what are the standards, what are the minimum standards that must be uh, uh, provided and what are the requirements that must be met within the domestic uh, legal system in order to uh, uh, give uh, 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 appropriate level of, of, of protection for, for judicial independence. So I think I'm, I'm I'm out of time, so I don't go to, to the other, okay, details. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Agnes? Sorry, I keep having questions. Uh, the problem with Court of Justice is that it does not give individual access to judges, isn't it? So, uh, and maybe the judges in JB and others were not just creative enough because there are two cases, Andras Baca and Alexander Volko, which dealt exactly with these issues yes. and where the judges prevailed. So, maybe the problem is with the quality of the applicants or the applications rather than, uh, than the court itself. Uh. It's a, it's, a, it's a very important questions, uh, question, and uh, it is interesting that the Baca case you refer to was decided primarily on Article 10 and was addressed as a freedom of sp speech case and not as a problem of judicial independence. But I know that it's, it, it is because, the, because it's very difficult to find the, the, the appropriate legal basis on which uh, the complaints can be uh, bring before the European Court of Human Rights. But I would not say that the Baca judgment was a better approach than any of the approach that was followed in the GB and other case. And just to add another thing, that Article 8 was not at all raised by the applicants, but it was... Uh, suggested by 
the court itself to deal with this issue under Article 8. And I think that it's, a, it's, a, it's not the good direction to address these, these structural problems under Article 8 and on, 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 on private issue or interference with, with, with uh, privacy. So even when, when, the, when the court reformulate and reframe the question, it, 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 had made, it, it had made, I think, big, big mistakes. <laughs>